Africa. This first song, Air. I love Air. I love the drive on this first song. It's just like it's so good. What's I that? love the drive on the first song. It's like, yeah. It's so fun. It's so, so fun. fun. It's so, thanks for playing. Oh, so I really fun. enjoy it. Good. Good. Yeah, I'll do it whenever you want. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, we're going to get started here soon, but if you didn't pick up a palm cross, make sure you do that. It's Palm Sunday, y'all. <laughs> they should be by the front doors. All right, good morning, everybody. It's 11 o'clock. It's time to worship our God. I'm so grateful to see all of you and to be here with all of you. Um, Palm Sunday is such a complicated day, but I'm really, really grateful that we get to pick up our palms or just pick up ourselves and lay them at the feet of Jesus. What a gift that we're able to do that. And no matter what you're feeling or facing or going through today, I just want you to know that Jesus sees you and loves you and uh, desires your presence with him just as much as we desire his presence with us. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's stand and let's worship God together. And Amari, will you hit the next slide? Let's all claim this together. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. You can put your hands together, church.
God for your children young and old God you said let the children come to you and I'm so grateful God that we get to witness to that and be that Lord blessed are you who comes blessed is the one who comes in the of the Lord blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord sing that out church blessed is the one who comes in the
are the broken people. And he comes for us, meets us where we are, and loves us. I was thinking this morning, if you feel misunderstood, Jesus was misunderstood. If you feel lost or abandoned or betrayed, Jesus experienced all of that. Abandonment, loss, betrayal. If you feel like you don't know your place, that you don't really fit in anywhere, that's how Jesus was. He didn't fit in in this world. He was so one of us, so human, and yet so divine. And the hurts and the brokenness of this world killed him. And so he is the most relatable, the most relatable divine presence that we could ever ask for or imagine. And so as we sing and my heart cries out, Hosanna, let it not be something distant from you, but let, let it be something relatable, intimate, and personal to you. This Jesus, this Jesus is so one of us. And he so loves you.
this church. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Jesus' name we pray and we all say, Amen. You may have a seat. And kids, come on up to the. Oh, there's no kids' message today. Just kidding. Kids, we love you so much. <laughs> Keep playing. <laughs> I was ready just in case you let that go. All right, we are continuing our way through the Gospel of Luke for this sermon series. We're reading Luke's account of Palm Sunday from chapter 19. When Jesus had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down the, from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden, now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Then he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were spellbound by what they had heard. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord God, every week I come up with a sermon and... I pray during the week that it's a word from you, and we pray that now. These are words of a page developed by an all-too-human preacher. But we crave your voice, God. We want to hear from you. So anything that's not from you, let it fly away and quickly be forgotten. But if your word is here, let it be heard, that we can take it into ourselves and become deeper, more devoted followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My mother, born Jeannie Scott McKenzie, was from Scotland, and even though she became an American citizen, she never let go of that Scottish identity, never really got over it. Now, there were good things having to do with that, some of them having to do with food, like my mother making her own crumpets and scones, and on Christmas we would have 
roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. And get, going to Scotland twice when I was growing up and getting to know my Scottish relatives, that was pretty great too. But there were not so great things about growing up with a Scottish mother, like her dressing me in a kilt when I was five years old, with not me not believing that this was not a dress, it's a kilt. There were some peculiar things, too, like my mother's attitude about St. Patrick's Day. Our family, we didn't believe in St. Patrick's Day. We didn't dress in green on St. Patrick's Day. We didn't watch the parade. My mother's attitude was, we're Scottish, not Irish. And besides, what kind of people throw a parade to celebrate themselves anyway? Who do they think they are? You could say the same thing about Jesus. Throwing himself a parade? Who did he think he was? Well, he was pretty clear about that. He was the Son of God and Lord of all, King of all creation, Lord of our lives, and he announced that by throwing himself a parade on Palm Sunday. Yeah, Jesus threw himself a parade. This wasn't any spontaneous celebration of some random people who happened to spot Jesus riding in on a donkey and like Mardi Gras revelers who are always ready for a party, they begin spontaneously shouting out, hey, yippee, yay, go Jesus. And it's not like people started cheering Hosanna and caught Jesus by surprise either. Now the surprise in the story is that Jesus arranged the whole thing. This is a piece of public street theater. And Luke describes how Jesus did it. The donkey came from someone who already knew Jesus. The crowds who cheered for him were largely his followers who followed Jesus from Galilee down to Jerusalem. And Jesus deliberately climbed on the back of that donkey and rode into the city, bursting at the seams with people who are there to celebrate Passover. He did that in order to fulfill a prophecy about the Messiah. Jesus staged the whole thing to announce that he is King and Lord. He rode into that city to save us and to save this suffering world. Now the people who were cheering at the parade weren't faking it. When they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they really meant it because they were people desperate for hope, suffering people desperate for God to intervene and save them because their world was a cruel one. They weren't free, they were a nation occupied by the Romans, and the Romans did some great things. They built roads straight as a yardstick, some of which you can still walk today. They built baths and gymnasiums and theaters and aqueducts, and they united hundreds of different ethnicities in one empire. But it was a cruel, cruel empire built on the back of slaves. Fully one-third of the people in Rome were slaves. It was an empire built on violence. During one rebellion that took place in Israel after the time of Jesus, the Romans crucified 500 Jews every day as a warning, as a way to say, hey, we're boss, don't even think about it. And it was an empire that bled the people dry through crushing taxes that were used to support Rome's immense military machine and all those public buildings. Maybe we see a parallel today to the cruelty of Rome with the cruelty and barbarism of the Russian government and army towards Ukraine. The pictures and descriptions that are coming out of cities from which the Russians pulled back Hundreds of civilians executed in cold blood. Women raped and shot and then left naked in the streets. Whole city blocks pulverized into rubble. A missile attack on a train station being used to evacuate refugees. And the greatest obscenity of, of President Putin claiming to be a Christian and acting as one and the patriarch of the Russian church supporting the war. It is a combination of an evil regime and a corrupt religious establishment working together for evil. And that was the situation Jesus confronted as well. Church and state tangled up in an unholy alliance. The religious establishment collaborating with Rome 
and profiting from it. Rome using the religious establishment to help keep the peace. And so Jesus' first stop after riding into Jerusalem is the temple. And that temple, the whole city, it's packed with people there for Passover. And Jesus goes to that table, and what is the temple, and what does he do? What's he do? Somebody help me here. Yes, he chases the people out. He makes a whip and chases out all the merchants who have set up shop in the temple. Now, what sets him off? That's the only time in the Gospels that we see Jesus acting anything like that, right? What sets him off? Well, the temple had an evangelistic purpose that goes all the way back to God's promise to Abraham and Sarah that the whole world would be blessed through your descendants. All the peoples of the world, meaning Gentiles, non-Jews, like us. And so the temple was built with a special place for the Gentiles called the Court of the Gentiles for non-Jews who wanted to come and worship and encounter the God of Israel. But here's what happened. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, the Court of the Gentiles had been turned into a marketplace. Before Jesus' time, the marketplace was outside the temple. But during Jesus' time, the high priest Caiaphas wanted a taste of the action, wanted a percentage of the profits from the market. So he brought the market into the temple. How you doing? How you doing? <laughs> and they set it up right in the court of the Gentiles. A shocking desecration of the temple. So imagine you're a spiritually seeking Gentile and you make the long journey from wherever to Jerusalem and you go to the temple and you want to meet and encounter and worship the one true God and you go into the court of the Gentiles reserved just for you and what do you find? A market full of bleeding sheep and goats carpeting with manure, people haggling and shouting and jostling. You've been crowded out. The leaders of the people of God, the ones who were chosen to be a witness to God's love and mercy and law, have taken your part of the temple and turned it into a bazaar. And so Jesus declares himself Lord of the temple. And he makes a whip and he goes on a righteous rampage and cleaned that place out. Jesus was saying, I'm Lord of the temple. And he's Lord of the church, too. Presbyterians have a church constitution. Who here can name one part of that constitution? Wow. <laughs> Nobody. Wh what's that? <laughs> the Book of Order and the Book of Confessions. Book of Confessions contains our theology. The Book of Order contains our form of government. And in the Book of Order, it says specifically that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And that when Christ reveals his will to the church, his will is to be obeyed. Right there in black and white. The joy and challenge for us here this morning at Central during Palm Sunday is to receive Jesus as our king and as head of the church and follow his will, his lordship, no matter how challenging that may be, and that ain't always easy. We have big questions, big challenges in front of us, like having to do with worship. Do we have one service or two services? If we have two services, are they both going to be traditional are they both going to be contemporary, or are we going to have one traditional and one contemporary? Then a big one, what time do we have these services? Which one is at 9 o'clock and which is at 11? And then the question of this controversy of resettling an Afghan refugee family. We have big questions, big challenges in front of us. And as we seek what to do, what decision to make for all those questions, for any question that faces us as a church. It's not what I want. It's not what you want. 
It's what the Lord Jesus wants for this church. And we know that God is one who seeks the lost. Jesus told us this parable about the shepherd who leaves 99 sheep to seek the one who's lost. We know from church history that people like John Wesley went outside the bounds of the established Anglican church services to reach people who weren't being able to come, come to church in the Anglican church. We know that God has a heart for the refugees and for the immigrants. It's all through the Bible. This stuff is there for us, and when the Lord Jesus Christ, in God's Word, reveals His will for us, the challenge is for us, are we going to want what we want, or are we going to follow our Lord? Now, I'm not saying those answers are always easy or apparent. I'm not saying that they appear magically before us. But the right questions yield the right answers. What does Jesus want for our church? He's Lord of the church, head of the church, and when he reveals his will, it is to be obeyed. All right, on to you and me. Three, four weeks ago in this service, we ordained and installed new officers, and I'm grateful for them. But the ones who are serving for the first time, I always wonder if they know what they're getting themselves into. It's not so much that they have to come to a meeting once a month, or if they're on the trustees that they get saddled with a huge project like fixing a steeple that is in danger of maybe toppling over at huge expense. It's in their ordination vows, this huge challenge, that says, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church. Lord of all means Lord of the whole universe. And Lord of your life, Lord of my life too. Lord of your life. Think of it this way. You remember when you learned to drive? Or some of you were so, so wanting that to happen. One of the best six hours of my life took place in the summer of 1975. My best friend David was a year older and already had his driver's license. And David's father, Howard, had a new MG convertible, orange. David's family and my family would vacation in Vermont together. And that summer in 1975, David and I got to drive that MG from New Jersey up to Vermont. Two teenage boys in a cool car on a perfect day with a top down, driving from Jersey to Vermont. It was like heaven on earth. <laughs> you remember the day that your mom or dad first tossed you the keys to the family car? You would count them down the days until you were going to get your license. You studied that little book from PennDOT. Maybe you took a driver's ed class in high school. Then you take the test and you pass it and you get that laminated rectangle of righteousness that you put in your wallet. And then you got to drive. You drive anywhere. We're out of milk? Sure. No, I'll go down to the store and get some milk. Driving means freedom. It means you're in charge. You set the destination. The only thing stops you is if you don't have money for gas. But then if you have children and they become teenagers, then the shoe's on the other foot. One day you have to slide over to the passenger seat and hand the keys to your child and let him or her drive. Maybe you start out in a parking lot or on a, then go to a back street. What's really fun, if you haven't done it, is teaching someone how to drive a car with a clutch. <laughs> Wear a neck brace if you ever try that one. <laughs> but the point is, you as a parent have to give up control. They learn to drive, they want to drive, and they choose the route. And if you try and tell them there's a better way to go, it's not welcome. They're driving now and you're not. I'm going to tell you the hardest thing but the most important thing you need to know about being a Christian. If Jesus is going to be king, he's in the driver's seat of your life and you are not. And he has to be. And that means surrendering to Jesus' lordship in every area of your life your marriage, your money, your sexuality, your time, your future, your security, all of it. I mean, do you really want the world to be a better place? Do you want to make a difference with your life? 
Do you want to be a better person, friend, spouse, parent, whatever? More kind, generous, caring. I don't know about you, but my story is that I can't do it on my own. My experience is that it's Jesus Christ alone who makes me want to be a better man, who gives me the stuff to be a better man. Because the hard truth about me is that I am selfish. I am controlling. I want things my way according to my schedule. I'm sinful and stubborn and most of the time don't even see it in myself. And a lot of times, in terms of faith, I want to use God as my personal assistant to arrange my life according to my specifications. I don't know about you, but I need to surrender. I need to yield control to Jesus as Lord because when I don't, I make a hell of a mess of things. And this is why we need a king to ride in and take charge. This is why we have to yield control. And you probably know what areas of your life that you need to yield to Christ. And I would guess that those are probably the areas of your life that are giving you the most trouble and pain and grief. Could be it's even your whole self you need to surrender to the Lord Jesus. And this is the story of all of us, really. It's the story of all human history. The world isn't a mess because... There are bad people out there doing all the bad stuff. Solzhenitsyn said that the line dividing good from evil runs right through the center of every human heart. The world is the way it is because all of us are lost and confused, yet we still insist on being in control. We must surrender to the Lord. Surrendering our, our, surrendering our wills is the hardest thing that Christ calls us to do. But remember, we're not called to be successful. We're called to surrender to the Lord and let Him be our Lord and trust that God will work for good in us and through us and for the people around us and use us to help build a better world. And if you do, Jesus Christ holds out to you a life of blessing and hope and strength beyond anything you can imagine. Surrender doesn't make you weak. It makes you strong. And in knowing and following Jesus, it's non-negotiable. With him, it's all or nothing. Well, in conclusion, next June it's going to be 70 years since the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. And what a day that was. It began with a procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey, the site of English and British coronations of their monarchs going all the way back to King Harold II in 1066. The evening before, it's pouring rain, but thousands of eager spectators camped out overnight to snag the best seats to watch the parade. On the day itself, there were an estimated three million people lining the streets to cheer the new queen. The procession was led by massed bands of the Brigade of Guards, following by contingents of the armed forces of the Commonwealth nations. Heads of state, foreign royalty, followed, traveling by coach. And they were followed by the queen herself, in the gold state coach pulled by eight white horses. Once they got to Westminster Abbey, the queen alighted from her carriage. Attached to the shoulders of her dress, she had the robe of state, a six-yard long, hand-woven silk velvet cloak lined with Canadian ermine. And she wouldn't be able to move an inch unless her ladies at waiting helped pick that thing up so she could walk forward. Westminster was packed with people from all over the world. Elizabeth took a vow to protect the British Empire and the Protestant Church, too. There was a communion service, and then she was crowned queen with a magnificent St. Edward's crown. Not long after his ride into Jerusalem, Jesus would also be crowned king. But his coronation took place while he hung from a cross with a mocking sign above his head that read, King of the Jews, and a crown of thorns 
jammed down on his brow. Yet that was part of his kingship too. Because he was a king who came to suffer and die for us. That we could be free from the powers of sin and death. So he could free the whole world from its bondage to evil. Jesus died so you could be free. That's someone I want to follow. That's someone who is so good, so worthy, and so true that we ought to make him Lord of our lives. Amen. That's the kind of Jesus I want to follow, too. How about you? Amen. We're going to take up this, off, this uh, time of offering right now. Um, offer as you desire your prayers, your attention, your focus, your silence. And be in this moment with the Lord. Um, if you would like to give, if you are able to give, um, in terms of your resources, uh, you can do so online. Uh, there are baskets at the doors as well. And God, we offer aloud the prayers of names of people and circumstances to which we need your help. Lift up those who are grieving, Lord. Dalton family, the Deal family, the Williams family, the Dodd family. for an end to the war in Ukraine, Lord, for you to change President Putin's heart. Let there be peace. Let there be hope. Let there be restoration, God. And as we lift all these prayers up to you, the ones we said out loud or the ones we said silently, we know that you hear them and we thank you, God, that you do. And we continue praying with the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, let's stand. And I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
And now may the love, the mercy, the peace of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all. Amen.